Dr. Tim Schonk, and I'm here talking to you today about the difference between allegory and symbolism. And I thought we'd start with a supposition. Let's assume that you're taking a Renaissance literature class and you've read uh, parts of the Fairy Queen. And by some miraculous divine intervention, you begin to understand some elements of this labyrinthine tale of the Red Cross Knight. You find significance in the character named Una, Latin for one, and in the infamous Kirkrapim, uh, meaning church raper, church robber. And you come to the conclusion that the story is uh, a symbol of the Red Knight's pursuit of the true faith while being threatened by enemies. Later in the afternoon in your American literature class, you're discussing Young Goodman Brown. Young Goodman Brown is the story of a young man's uh, journey through the woods. He leaves his wife, Faith, at home and uh, meets a satanic character in the woods who tries to encourage him to join a community of sinners. Brown apparently resists this um, invitation and uh, makes it to the end of the woods, albeit leading a sad life. You have a sudden thought. Uh, Goodman Brown's journey is a symbol of the Christian's uh, journey on the path of righteousness. In both your paper and your discussion of the story, you are right, almost. Okay. What you've done is to confuse allegory and symbol. Uh, as many undergraduates do, they tend to see any representation as symbolism and begin then to paint representations with a broad stroke. Allegory can be seen as a kind of symbolism, but it's a special kind of symbolism. It's more of a one-to-one -one correspondence, whereas symbolism tends to have numerous correspondences. As M. H. Abrams put it, um, an allegory is a story that makes sense on a literal superficial level, but it signifies another story on a more complex level. Um, the Red Cross Knight combats evil and pursues the Lady Una. So on the one hand, it could be the literal level, as Abrams would put it, it is the simple story of a knight errant serving his lady. But on the second level, it could also be the true Christian's pursuit of the one true faith, and in that level we enter into the realm of allegory. Allegories can be political religious allegory, in which case the numerous characters represent events and characters at moments of historical crises or other significant events. In Chaucer's Parliament of Fowls, for example, we have a female eagle who's being pursued by three male eagles. Many critics see this as an allegorical representation of Chaucer's engaging in the efforts to marry Richard II to Anne of Bohemia, who is also being pursued by two other princes on the continent. We also can enter into religious allegory. And in religious allegory, the characters in the story on the superficial level come to represent on the second level an event from the Bible. In Chaucer's Nun's Priest Tale, for example, when the proud rooster swoops down from the beam to consort with the hen Pertilote and is grabbed by the fox, we could read that as an allegorical tale from the Bible. The man, in this case, in the medieval view, uh, seduced by a pretty face, makes his descent, his fall, and is captured by the fox, Satan. Uh, we can also see allegory on a moral level. In this case, the characters, maybe even with the exact name of the moral element, uh, appear in the story. A most famous case in, occurs in the Middle Ages when we have the parade of seven deadly sins. And you might have lust riding in, dressed in red, r leading a goat. The character sloth riding a mule, drowsy-eyed, almost falling asleep and uh, losing his mount. Those are on the allegorical level. In contrast, a symbol, uh, rather than having a one-to-one -one correspondence, will have a variety of meanings. As one wag put it, it was important that Melville invented such a huge symbol as the white whale to hold all the meanings that critics have put into it. <laughs> okay. So let's take, for example, um, um, a story in which a lady occurs dressed in a white gown. Does the white gown suggest innocence, the oppression of the white race, a moral void, all of these, some of these. This is probably on the level of symbolism. If her name is Virginia and she is being pursued and threatened by 
uh, Sir de France and others, then we're probably on the level of political allegory. Um, symbolism is rich in its suggestiveness. Allegory is rich in its specific uh, reference to other events outside the text. So I'll close with a little story of a student of mine who came by. Uh, we'll call him Dubitas, which is Latin for doubting. <laughs> And he came by my office upset that he was not advancing as quickly to the professorial level as he thought he should. Uh, he attends classes and he reads the text, but he's not finding his fulfillment. When I asked to see his notebook in which he was supposed to write uh, further thoughts that he had on the readings and do some research, he opened his notebook to show me all white pages, nothing written on them. Now, Dubitas is obviously an allegorical character uh, representing the beginning student's uh, journey to enlightenment and education. His white notebook is a symbol, an unfulfilled contract in terms of learning, uh, a void in his learning, an inability to comprehend thoughts perhaps. At any rate, the hope is that as Dubitas continues and learns his part of the contract of being a student and fills these voids in his white notebook, that he will advance and come to a successful conclusion, including being able to talk and write precisely about symbolism and allegory.